The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm excited to bring our webinar to you today. Um, we will be looking at opportunities for walkability in rural communities and small towns. I apologize. That slide has the wrong date on it, and I'm just recognizing that now. It is obviously July 11th, 2018, and we're happy to have you with us. My name is Heidi Simon. I am the uh, deputy director here at AmeriCoWalks, and I'm here with my colleague, Kelsey Card, and we're ha happy to have you with us. I want to just give a quick shout out to some of our sponsors who helped make this program and all of the programs at AmeriCoWalks possible. Um, we are grateful to the Centers for Disease Control, American Public Health Association, and the members of the Everybody Walk Collaborative for their support as well as um, our regular sponsors who support all of our programming, some of which you see here on the screen. We do want this to be an interactive uh, webinar today and as engaging as possible. So if you have a question for any of our panelists as they're speaking, please do enter it into the question box on your GoToWebinar control panel. If you are having any difficulties, um, please um, enter that as well in the, in the question box and Kelsey will help you address them. Um, we will get to as many questions as possible at the end of the hour and any questions that we don't get to we'll try and get you answers afterwards by email i'm going to answer one question that i know we will be seeing uh, in that control panel box and that is that yes this webinar is being recorded and we will make um, available as many of the resources and slides as possible to you afterwards in your follow-up email we have a great panel for you today um, to talk about oral walkability i'm excited to bring it to you. Um, Dr. Renee Asset Meyer and her colleague Kesha Bullock Porter will be presenting on some research that they've recently done. Corey Ann Payton Scally, who's with the Urban Institute, um, Rebecca Williams, who, who is with the Southeast ACA Center and is representing our friends at April today, and um, a special guest, Mary Joseph Semberger of Elmer, New Jersey. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our first presenter, Corianne Payton Scali, to present on her work and the intersections of walkability. Good afternoon. Looks great, Corianne. Thank you for joining Take us this afternoon. I'm happy to help set the stage for our conversation on rural walkability by providing kind of a broad overview of some of the challenges of um, walkability faced by rural communities, some of the benefits of pursuing it, and some solutions, mostly from a local government uh, perspective. And I'm really eager to hear from the other panelists that are going to be sharing their own research and their own uh, perspectives from their practice. So I'm going to run through these in order, talking about some of the general challenges, uh, why it's important, and what some solutions might look like. So the first challenge uh, that rural communities can face is lack of appropriate infrastructure for walkability. And a lot of this is due to the low density development patterns uh, that encourage roads um, and car dependency while often discouraging sidewalks and other ways of getting around town. As I'm sure a lot of you know, most of the land uh, in our country is rural and 80% of our roadways pass through rural land. Um, roads Rural roads tend to be auto-centric and many are lacking sidewalks or clear pedestrian markings such as crosswalks at major intersections, um, even in the middle of rural town centers. Um, and this jeopardizes pedestrian safety. Another challenge is uh, due to these development patterns are long distances between destinations, uh, which result in lengthened commute times between home, school, work, and services. Um, and this costs residents uh, rural residents, both time and money. And a final challenge uh, is from the unique land uses and infrastructure constraints that many rural communities face. 
Agricultural land uses affect the pattern of local development and infrastructure. Uh, access roads to farms have special requirements for accommodating agricultural equipment and vehicles. Uh, there's also a lot of public land, of course, located in rural communities, such as parks and forests, which are popular destinations, both for local residents as well as tourists. But these can be difficult to link to via walkable infrastructure to surrounding rural communities. Rural roads are often constrained by land features, uh, such as mountains, roads, creeks, and such that can make them hard to modify to accommodate other modes of transportation. Um, and then finally, a lot of rural towns experience the fact that state highways often pass straight through their town centers, um, prioritizing the flow of cars through town rather than the flow of local people around town. And some of these highways can be very wide and others may be narrow. Um, and regardless, both can be very difficult to modify to improve walkability. Why promote rural walkability specifically? Um, well, it does improve access. It helps increase options for those without cars or access to public transportation options. 94% uh, of rural households own a private vehicle, but these are more likely to be used vehicles and also to require more money to fill up compared to urban vehicle owners. And those without cars are more likely to live in poorer areas of town as well as communities of color. Meanwhile, only 11% of rural households have access to public transportation. Improving rural walkability also helps connect communities by reducing barriers caused by physical divides, such as the state highways, um, as well as increasing connections to surrounding amenities, such as public lands. Improving rural walkability also promotes health and safety. Um, in the United States, rural areas have significantly higher prevalence of um, overweight uh, and obesity, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, stroke um, than urban areas. And we know that physical activity can improve some of these health statuses. There's also low levels of active commuting in rural areas. A 2017 study found that less than three and a half percent of rural workers aged 16 and older were walking to work and even fewer were riding bikes. Uh, more walking also means less air pollution from cars and eventually pollution from water runoff uh, on roads. Uh, and then finally, while less than 20 percent of our population lives in rural areas, 58 percent of car crashes and 68 percent of traffic fatalities are in rural areas. Of course, this is mostly a function of uh, most of our roads being in rural areas and going through rural communities, but of course, reducing car trips uh, will reduce these related accidents. And finally, increasing walkability saves money. Um, Smart Growth America has found that creating more physically compact community saves on average um, around 38% of local capital costs on building infrastructure and about 10% annually on operating costs. Um, it also increases the local revenue that can be produced by a single acre of land uh, by about 10 times the amount. Um, of course, there are individual cost savings as well uh, when uh, individuals are going um, shorter distances to get where they need to go and not requiring a car to do so. So I just want to focus on um, a couple different solutions. Uh, one way to address uh, the issue of rural walkability is to try and retrofit existing infrastructure. Um, communities can improve their existing infrastructure using um, a lot of different techniques. I'm just going to touch on two today. Uh, one is complete streets, and others is through the development of multimodal networks. Um, Many of you are probably familiar with complete streets. This focuses on incorporating all transportation modes together along a single route, say through a main street going through the town center. A multimodal network uh, helps make smoother connections between modes. For example, where a bike path uh, running in one direction might cross a street and or sidewalk that's running in a perpendicular manner. 
Um, and these uh, networks also pay close attention to who is most likely to use the walking paths based on the destinations that are being connected. And I have a couple of examples to show for this. This is an example of um, one way to address rural walkability by retrofitting an existing rural road, adding a pedestrian shoulder, what's called an enhanced shoulder to the road, um, to help provide a safe place to walk that is clearly marked, adding a crosswalk uh, where there might not have been one. And um, you can see uh, that probably the traffic speeds have been reduced to also accommodate um, bike travel in the car lanes. This is an example of the multimodal network um, and an example of a network that is specifically trying to enhance connections between where children live and where they attend school to encourage safe walking and biking between home and school. Uh, again, by linking the population centers through enhanced shoulders, as well as um, safe side paths to encourage safe routes to school. A final strategy I'll touch on today is the ability of rural towns to concentrate new development. Um, and this is by encouraging smart decisions on where to site new development and facilities, including uh, housing and public and community facilities, as well as others. This includes understanding population trends and how the population is projected to change over time, identifying current and future needs for critical community infrastructure, such as housing, schools, health facilities, business space, and other services. And then finally, examining existing land uses to find opportunities for infill development where new necessary infrastructure can be built. Making these smart decisions often reduces costs as well at the local level, and I'll share an example in just a moment. I did want to highlight that Smart Growth America uh, worked uh, through a cooperative agreement with USDA's Rural Development Division to examine some of these issues more closely, and they do have um, some good resources available on their website. Um, and I drew these examples uh, from those resources. Here's an example uh, looking at population growth projected for the small town of Rifle, Colorado, um, and thinking through scenarios on how to accommodate the new population growth through um, additional housing development. And here we see several different, uh, several different scenarios that project what it will cost um, the town in infrastructure to accommodate those new housing units based on the densities that they are planned for as well as their location. And the baseline projection shows their existing average density, number of households per acre, all the way up to the highest density option, which is alternative C. And this uh, calculation that was based on the real infrastructure costs incur incurred by RIFL uh, shows that the uh, denser the development, the lower the projected infrastructure costs are for the town. And my final example uh, is the case of Easton, Maryland, uh, which uh, at the time that this decision making was being conducted had a population of about uh, just under 12,000 people um, and originally had proposed a new facility um, that was going to be located four miles away from the current public social services building. Um, and that's represented, uh, the proposed site was represented by the red triangle that's up near the top of the, um, of the town's uh, border. Um, but they were able to work successfully with county and state officials to repurpose another site that was still in the center of town uh, and able to keep these services within walking distance of many of its clients who lived in the town center. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing your questions later. Great. Thank you, Corianne. Some great things to think about as we talk about
about this topic. Um, now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Renee Umstead Meyer, um, who's going to present on some research that she did with her colleague Kesha Pollock Porter. Perfect. Can y'all hear me? Yep, you're coming through nice and clear. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak with you today and talk about some work that we've been um, working on for the past two years and are very excited to continue to work on currently. And so I want to thank um, Keisha, who is my co-PI on this project, and acknowledge um, the Physical Activity Research Center, who we are funded through, which is a funding um, center through RWJ. And also before getting going, I also want to acknowledge some other of our team members who are essential in um, with this specific data collection that I'm going to talk about today. And this is my brief slide to touch on a few things that Corian just spent much more time in depth going through and just highlighting. But I just want to paint a little bit broader picture around active living. And I know today's talk is more around walkability and livability within rural communities, but that overarching umbrella around active living and what it looks like with physical activity in, in many um, rural communities in America. And so um, within many rural um, communities, as Crayon just said, we have um, many youth growing up in those areas. We also have many rural communities with their communities of color as well that have even lower percentages of the youth meeting physical activity guidelines in those communities. And over 19%, based on some estimations of the youth population, actually lives in rural communities, as well as when you look at geographically how much um, of America is, is rural by most definitions. People living in rural communities also face a variety of unique obstacles that Corian just really went into some great um, detail describing what some of those are in terms of dispersion um, and land use and fewer walkable destinations, some of the transportation infrastructure that's different, and Really, they're just being scarcely available physical activity and active living and walkability type of infrastructure in many rural communities. Two other terms that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. Um, walkability, yes, and I'm guessing that everybody on the call is familiar with this term, but also talking about active transportation, which is one umbrella term that, that walkability can fit under, and specifically about those ideas within rural communities. Sometimes these these terms and these ideas and concepts are very similar to what we hear about, what we see in urban and suburban contexts, and sometimes they're a little bit different, and um, sometimes they're drastically different. If we have a rural community that has a town center as part of that rural community, then oftentimes walkability and active transportation does mirror what we think of in urban and suburban contexts. And then when we have um, other rural communities that aren't necessarily situated or other residents in rural communities that aren't within that town hub, it looks different. And so active transportation, defined by CDC for one definition, any self-propelled human power, powered mode of transportation, such as walking or bicycling. But there's really some evidence, both in my own work and in work from colleagues across the country and many various rural communities where Rural residents really think of active, active transportation differently than that idea of my body moving me from place to place in a physical manner, but rather this idea that active transportation is the ability and the availability of transportation to get someone to the location where a physical activity resource or programming or other type of physical activity space is. Um, and so that's just a different um, piece that's come out in my own work and others' work that's really a different nuance around what active transportation is. The other thing that I wanted to, to highlight is um, a definition around walkability from the community builders group that walkability is more than providing residents with the ability to walk, but successful walkable communities incorporate really three characteristics by their definition or their three P's of physical access, places, and proximity. And so what I'm going to talk about today isn't necessarily about that traditional definition of walkability, but rather this idea of physical access to places to do physical activity and how if they're located within a community organization um, or a community infrastructure that they can be um, accessible, not necessarily next door to everybody's home in a rural community, but more accessible. And so I want to talk about our work with Play Street in the last two years and some definitions around Play Street um, and the pictures on the right are provided by World Sports Chicago, which have been doing Play Street since 2012. And I want you to note these pictures because in a minute I'm going to show you some pictures from what our rural Play Street looks like. But temporary street closures that um, close either periodically or re 
um, or episodic um, to create safe spaces for play, for children to be physically active without traffic, safety concerns, and they really have a, a potential to build on a culture and demand for safe play. Most play streets have occurred in urban areas, and so we worked with some rural community partners in the last year and are continuing to work with them this year are, to better understand the idea of play streets in rural communities. There's also limited work on evaluation in any setting and it really being disseminated. So the purpose of some of this work has been to examine how play streets impact the physical activity of youth residing in rural communities. And last summer, we worked with um, four um, racially and ethnically diverse low-income rural communities. We provided small mini-grants, $6,000 total, to four community organizations that we already had connections with that were, had already implemented some sort of um, organized activity before, not necessarily physically act, physical activity activity, but they had some of that capacity already there. And um, we had them tailor four play streets across the summer for their communities, each being a three-hour minimum in time. And at least $1,000 of that money had to be used, not necessarily for permanent um, park type of infrastructure, but rather permanent equipment that can be reused versus rental equipment or food types of things, perishables. And that remaining 5,000 can be used. They did propose a budget, but it was really up to them to come up with what made the most sense for their communities to use the remainder, the remainder of that mini grant for. And we provided resources and technical support, but we really provided minimal direction. We wanted to make sure that um, our implementation groups, our community partners really tailored for what they felt would be the most successful, most useful for their communities. And so to describe our four community partners that we worked with, um, all four communities, their start here had um, household incomes of less than 36,000. Um, roughly all using the rural urban community codes, the RUCA codes range from 7.1 um, in Cameron, Texas, for those of you familiar with that um, rural definition, the population in Cameron, Texas is about 5,500, the county population about 24,000, um, all the way to 10.3 RUCA code in Oakland, Maryland, with a town size of 1,800, county population just under 30,000, and our smallest town was Warrenton, North Carolina with 852 people. Cameron, Texas has a large representation of Hispanic Latino residents, and we partnered with the AgriLife Extension, and Milan County is our community partner. Palahina, Oklahoma is in the heart of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and serves a large portion of American Indian residents, and we partnered with Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. In Warrington, North Carolina, um, we partnered with a local Baptist church, or Curly Baptist Church in Warrington, and it's a predominantly African-American black community. Our residents in Oakland, Maryland are predominantly white Caucasian and we partner with the local health department um, in Oakland. Just for some information around those communities that we partnered with. And some brief, a brief description of our methods um, for Play Streets. We recruited children um, aged at entering elementary to middle school, which ranged whether or not there was a pre-K in that school system, how young those youth were and also adult guardians. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about some results from pedometers that we um, have. We recruited youth to wear measuring steps during play streets and also we conducted observations using the system for ob observing play and recreation in communities or the SOPARC and we actually used the iPad version of that for those of you familiar with that method and so we used the ISOPARC. We also administered surveys to children and adult guardians and recorded direct observations, but I'm going to focus on those two um, methods as I talk today. And, I, and this just is a, an image of a, a recent play street in Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, just to see show you that some differences between those original pictures in Chicago. And so what we have found in rural communities is often streets aren't being used because if you have just one main thoroughfare, um, as Corian was describing, of a main highway going through a town, you can't just shut that down. It doesn't quite work that easily, um, and there's no way you're going to get a permit to do so. And it's definitely not creating safe space because those vehicles still have to go somewhere. So oftentimes, our community partners were using parking lots, open fields, which are more available in many rural communities and in urban suburban areas, and or other infrastructures like school school grounds or school playgrounds um, and some park areas that weren't being accessed by community residents as much. The other thing that were a little bit different is our communities often partnered with other community programming to make those um, play streets more accessible because people were already 
coming into those parts of the community, driving in from where they lived, and so to capitalize on that transportation challenge, if many of our community partners would partner with another event happening, a uh, back-to-school event or a summer feeding program or another type of community um, partnership. So some things that really try to address some of those challenges from a walkability standpoint in many rural areas. So some preliminary findings. Um, these are some pedometer findings that we had. And so a mean of almost 24 children um, agreed to participate in wearing pedometers per play street. And a child could participate in a play street without wearing a pedometer. And so this isn't everybody that attended, but those who had, um, who consented also had parental um, permission or guardian permission. We had a mean age of almost nine years, just over 50% were female. We had across all 16 play streets last summer, just over 350 children with complete data. And you can see that there is an average wear time of about an hour and a half. And children could choose to take on or off that pedometer before they left. And so that's not necessarily an exact number of how long. But we actually had a, a decent number of steps per minute. Um, our child, our youth, looking at our ISO park observations, you can tell that we predominantly had youth participating at the play streets. We did have some adults that were there, but mostly youth, which was great to see. And when we looked at um, what people were doing in those spaces, our youth were doing a large portion of moderate to vigorous physical activity at the various um, target areas or stations within a play street. And so of the different types of um, the locations within a play street, what we really found, and you'll see a grouping of what some different community partners offered, is that many children were in bounce houses and that moderate to vigorous activity was happening in bounce houses a lot, which was really cool to see. And in this slide, which, I'll tell, which you can tell is that there really was um, not a difference between boys and girls, especially within bounce houses. That we kind of thought of bounce houses as an equalizer across the genders, that you could see both moderate and vigorous activity happening across both boys and girls. So some initial conclusions, kids are active at play streets in rural communities. Kids like being on bounce houses and inflatables. And gender difference are really slight and really not significant in our work until teenage years. And, but really when you look at it, most boys and girls who attended play streets were moving while they were there. The so future works should consider examining impacts on normal physical activity, including accelerometry in addition to just pedometry, and examining sustainability for potential of play streets. And what we're doing right now is we're currently working to understand the sustainability idea of play streets in rural communities. Three of our 2017 community partners are implementing three or more play streets this summer. We're giving them $500 per play street this year to see if that works from a sustainability standpoint. They have equipment left over from last year. That's about what we're figuring out for, for renting the inflatables. And we're also developing an implementation guide for rural communities to use in planning future play streets throughout the end of this year, hopefully really soon early next year. And we continue to examine how rural and urban play streets differ and or are similar. We're partnering with um, Wells Sports Chicago in Chicago to look at some of those urban implementation outcomes, as well as continuing to work with our, our, our rural partners this year. Some references, and just a thank you to all of our team members, our community partners, and again, um, the Physical Activity Research Center and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and America Walks for this opportunity to talk today. Great, thank you. And thank you for sharing your work. It's, it's always great to see those smiling faces. Nothing speaks louder um, than that in terms of success of physical activity. Um, and America Walks, you know, we're committed to walkability for all community members. And with that in mind, we've invited our next speaker, Rebecca Williams, to talk a little bit about what walkability means for people with disabilities in rural communities and small towns. Um, so Rebecca, you're gonna wanna put your PowerPoint on screen. Yeah, I I clicked the link to show screen, but it's not coming up. It's 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 showing screen. There you go. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, whoops, I'm sorry, I went too fast. Uh, I'm here actually at the request of Billy Altum, uh, who is the executive director for April. And for those of you who don't know, April is the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living. It is uh, an organization made up of folks who work at Centers for Independent Living, folks with disabilities, and others interested in improving the overall life for folks with disabilities um, in the United States. And I work for the uh, Southeast ADA Center. I am one of 10 technical assistance specialists on the ADA and other 
um, civil rights laws. Uh, we'll go through that one. Uh, one of April's overall advocacy uh, focuses is on transportation for rural people uh, with disabilities in the United States. And uh, but one of the first guiding principles about their transportation philosophy is that all public transportation should be accessible to all users at all times. And we feel that walking is also a form of public transportation because folks have the opportunity, if, if we have access, to use our public sideways and shared use paths and um, all that sort of stuff. And as uh, our other two speakers already said, as we all know, walking is a form of transportation. Folks can walk for exercise, engage with friends and families, you know, to get from one place to another, to get from my neighborhood to my other neighbor's house and maybe to my child's school. And walking is also critical for accessibility um, for folks with, with disabilities. Over one third of all Americans are not able to drive, uh, either because they're too old, too young, too poor, or have some form of disability. So for these folks, walking can be uh, very critical indeed. Um, I just got a picture up now that shows uh, what um, often walking looks like in rural America. Sometimes uh, limited road shoulders, shoulders, excuse me, mean people have to use their mobility devices in the roadways. Uh, many rural streets use stop signs rather than traffic signals, which increases time needed for some people to cross the street. That can lead to safety concerns and accidents with pedestrians. Often uh, times views are blocked by hills or curves. And then often too, also the lack of lighting can cause safety concerns for folks with mobility impairments. So I'm just gonna go over a few of the barriers to walking in rural America. We're gonna talk about um, unpaved, unbroken, or disconnected routes, when there's no inaccessible route, steep elevation changes, type of surface materials used, obstructed accessible routes, lack of signage, lack of places to rest, lack of water sources, lack of shade, and lack of accessible toilet facilities. Now, all of these that I just mentioned are not um, always required, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about if, if we're building uh, walkways, uh, common use paths, sidewalks, whatever, to incorporate some of these things are really helpful to folks with, with disabilities. I hate to say this, but this actually picture is actually my own neighborhood. Uh, the community, the township, did a really great sidewalk improvement on the other side of the streets, did an enhanced crop work, crosswalk with a pedestrian signal, and then on the other side of the street, they built this. Well, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so we need to think about <laughs> not spending our money for things that we don't need, but spending it where, um, where we're gonna have that connectivity. This actually is a good picture, shows a person in a wheelchair from, it looks like on the left, from a neighborhood. And he was able to come out of that neighborhood and use this walkway to perhaps access his neighbor's house or maybe uh, walk to the park, uh, do some sort of activities like that. No accessible route. So we have on the on the left a man who looks like to be on an accessible route in his community on a sidewalk, but then there's no way for him to get down. Now most people don't carry their own uh, portable ramp with them, but you've got to have somewhere to go, or else you might as well not even get out there in the first place. The other one on the right I just thought was kind of kind of funny because it shows the international symbol of accessibility, but then there's steps, so that's not really usable. One thing's um, curb ramps are required for accessible routes under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and there are specific requirements for slope and cross slope and that sort of thing. Another thing when we think about creating accessible routes, think about them being wide enough for somebody who uses a mobili mobility device to be walking beside somebody and their family. And then in addition to that, there's enough space for somebody coming the opposite direction to pass them. Now under the ADA, an accessible route is 36 inches. That's only three feet. Uh, that's really not usable. It's accessible, but it's not, it's not the best use. So we, we encourage at least a five foot uh, accessible route. Steep elevation changes. When elevation change is too steep for an individual who uses a mobility impairment to use it independently, that takes away their independence. 
it then makes them either reliant on a family member or friend uh, or somebody to get them to where they want to go or they just have to stay home. Type of surface material used. These may be hard for some people to see, but there's a, uh, the far left one is, a, is, is bricks. The center left is just like a concrete sidewalk. The center right is a crushed, uh, is a, I'm sorry, it's like a, a compacted dirt. And then the one in the right corner is a crushed gravel. This, the type of material used can have a big impact on different types of mobility devices used. Uh, routes in many rural areas are gravel or packed dirt. These can get difficult to navigate when wet. Gravel and mud can get on people's hands and cause cuts and abrasions when they're pushing a wheelchair. Uh, pushing hard on that kind of thing can cause blisters or sometimes damage to mobility devices. Another thing to think about that sometimes as surface roughness increases, the magnitude of vibrations that are felt by a wheelchair user increases. And some folks who use manual wheelchairs are susceptible to what's known as harmful whole body vibrations. And these vibrations could be hard enough for some people to actually cause bruising um, or pain because of the surface that is used. Uh, I'm maintaining a, unobstructed accessible routes this can be especially problematic in rural areas where we have uh, lots of snow buildup, lots of leaf buildup, other seasonal, seasonal uh, type of barriers that block an accessible route. Uh, the picture on the far right shows cracks in the accessible route. Tree roots can cause breakage in that accessible route that cause uh, uh, difficulties with continuing to keep going on my route. The middle picture shows a vehicle blocked in the sidewalk, blocking the sidewalk. So sometimes we have to work with our law enforcement agencies. We have to get a buy-in sometimes from local law enforcement that if there's an ordinance against blocking sidewalks or curb ramps, that law enforcement is gonna be willing to ticket the people that do that. I mean, even if it's in your driveway, you still can't block a sidewalk. So sometimes we need to try to get our local law enforcement in board with us about this. Signage can be important. Uh, it seems to be more important if we have a shared youth path, but signage is needed for people with disabilities so they can make informed choices regarding which route they want to take. Uh, if the route is a shared youth path, we may want to consider indicating uh, if a person might also encounter bicyclists, skateboarders, or inline skaters. The following type of information can be important on these kinds of signs, um, the length of the trail or trail segment, the type of surface material used, uh, the running slope and cross slope of a particular uh, path, which again, there are ADA requirements for that. These are just a couple more types of signs. It can be very important if somebody knows that there's a steep downgrade or upgrade but then there's an option like in the middle, uh, take this path that's more accessible. That can be important for somebody determining whether they're actually gonna go outside and, and walk on a path with their family because whether or not they know which way is safe for them to go. Some of the amenities that aren't necessary, but um, or aren't required, I should say, but are nice to add if, if we can add those are places to rest. Um, people sometimes, you know, they just need a space, a space to rest. If benches are provided, uh, it is recommended that a bench be placed off the accessible route and have a, a clear landing space be at one end of the route. So if somebody is using a mobility device, they can sit beside somebody else. You can rest a little bit, then they can continue on their excursion. The picture on the route just shows a really nice, it's a long trail. I can't tell from here if it's too steep or not, but you can see there's at least two benches there to give folks the opportunity to, to stop and rest. Um, something else I wanted to throw in here real quick, it doesn't really have to do with resting, but something else to take into consideration if we're developing um, accessible paths and uh, walking routes for our communities is, what is the air quality along a route? Uh, the air quality can greatly affect folks with respiratory, heart conditions, and some other types of um, disabilities. 
And if the, if the air quality is poor, that's going to prohibit people or deter people from coming out and, and walking. So sometimes maybe look at is there manufacturing in the area? What type of pollutants might be being emitted into the air before we start to actually build a route? Again, not required, but a source of water could be one of those uh, benefits and features that might help entice somebody with a disability to get out and, and walk more. Again, there's specific requirements under the ADA if you do provide a water fountain. And as with benches, have it off the path so it's not a protruding object, so people can still get around it. Must have a high-low water fountain um, if you're going to have fountains at all. And I see in this one, it's really kind of nice. They have um, a fountain if you have a, a dog that you're walking with. Another nice feature is to think about shade along our walkways. Will there be places for people who might have uh, sun or light sensitivities or be sensitive to the heat? Might there be a place where they can pull over and uh, get a break from the sun? Again, not required, but if you're developing a path and there are toilet facilities along the path, may need to consider doing alterations or renovations if there is not an accessible toilet facility. And now I just have a few pictures of folks with uh, different types of disabilities out enjoying their community on accessible pathways. There is a picture you see somebody actually with a service animal out there using a path. This fella uh, uh, is a below knee amputee and he actually, he's quote walking on a skateboard. So people sometimes walk uh, way, you know, many different ways. Here we have some ladies with visual impairments with their white canes and just some elderly people who often don't consider themselves as having a disability, they use a walking stick. They don't use a cane, according to them. This shows a picture of two fellows on segways. Now, there is something in the ADA and the new 2010 regulations that talks about other power-driven mobility devices. And those are any mobility devices powered by batteries, fuel, or other engines whether or not they were designed primarily for the use of individuals with disabilities, but that are used by individuals with mobility disabilities for the purpose of locomotion. And some of these other powered mobility devices can include golf carts, uh, electric personal assistance mobility devices such as these segways. They could be uh, electric bicycles. They could be ATVs. And I have had received some phone calls from my job with folks in rural America uh, who use ATV type pieces of equipment as their mobility device. And those need to be considered when we're looking at uh, building accessible routes for folks to use. Uh, what is the size of these ATVs or, or other power driven mobility devices? Where must we accept and where might we have to look at other features such as terrain and, and whatnot? But other power driven mobility devices are often used out in the rural community. Um, and then I just want to say there's a great program by the National Center on Health, Physical Activity and Disability called This Is How I Walk. And it's all geared towards if anybody doesn't know about it on People don't just use two legs to walk, they walk by all different means. And I'm just gonna, um, this is the my last actually picture slide. I just wanted to show that there are a variety of folks out using. And in this particular walk area, we can see that there's on the left side, there is a gravel pathway, but then yet on the white, right side, there is a cemented or macadam pathway. So that is accessible to all walkers. Um, anybody wants to know about transportation in rural America can contact Billy Alt. Altum. Folks have ADA questions, they can call their National ADA Center. And then I have some resources and all this I think is available, um, will be available later. So thank you. Thank you. And um, thanks for reminding us to be considering all of our community members when we talk about walkability. And yes, those resources will be included with the recording of the webinar in your follow up email. Um, so now we're going to go to someone who's putting all of this into practice as mayor of a small town in New Jersey. Um, so, Mayor Semberger, please take it away. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to be with everyone today. My presentation today is a visual presentation 
that will give you a perspective of the challenges and successes that we have achieved in the last six months and will continue until the completion of our project. I'll give a short overview of what our plans are for safe and healthy sidewalks and concentrate on the town sidewalks itself and the plans and requirements for both municipality, residents, and business. This photo, I have a few photos that I want, wanted to show you to show you how rural Elmerboro is. We're a town founded in 18. 93 by farmers and we continue to this day to still be a town for farmers and is the hub of the farming community. We're surrounded by two neighbors, Pittsgrove Township and Upper Pittsgrove Township. They have a total mass of about 88 square miles of farmland and Elmer Borough being the little entity with one square mile with a population of about 1300 people. Combined population of what we call the Greater Elmer area, which would include Upper Pittsgrove, Pittsgrove, and Elmer, is about 15,000 people. So really being the hub of the community for commerce, uh, anything to do with uh, how we have a hospital, schools, or within the con one mile confines of the borough. And uh, we are really like one community, not three. Um, our overview, um, I'm going to have a, uh, a short video right here, and uh, this will give you a great idea about how rural we are. People don't believe that uh, New Jersey can have uh, an area that is so rural with farms. Uh, it's, it's just a great place to live. And um, as you can see, this is our downtown area. And... Uh, we have nine, mi nine miles of sidewalk currently in the borough of Elmer. A uh, little bit later on, I'll show you what our challenges are with those nine miles of sidewalks. Now, if you can look in the center left, you'll see some ball fields with that open field with a ball field in the rear of it. That's a 15 acre community uh, Green Acres Park that we've just procured from the state of New Jersey. And uh, we have great plans for that. Um, Again, look at the overview, uh, amazing amount of farmland, uh, not populated a whole lot, but all combined, we have a, a real nice population of great individuals. Moving on to what our plan, just a quick overview of our plans. Uh, this is one element that we have, it's called the Elephant Swamp Trail. It was a uh, former railroad bed that ran from Atlantic City to uh, Glassboro uh, that has been abandoned about 25 years ago. And this elephant, elephant Swamp Trail is actually in Upper Pittsgrove Township, but they have partnered with, uh, with us to use that. It's 5.2 miles and it actually goes into the, a township north of us that also has quite a large park. Uh, this is very rural, farms, uh, woodland, animals, uh, a lot of wild game. It, it's just amazing that we have that at our, at our disposal. And that will hook, and it does hook, right to our 15-acre park, which right now is being farmed. We're trying to procure all the funding and all the engineering that we have to do, uh, where we'll have a half-mile paved walking trail, everything handicapped accessible, playgrounds, uh, small dog park, butterfly way stations. We really have a lot of interesting things coming together for this park. Uh, and as you can see with this picture here, uh, this park, along with the Elephant Swamp Trail, and this picture, you can see in the upper top right corner, the, the kind of brownish area, that is where the park is going to be, is connected to the town. So wherever you need to go to the park, we have sidewalks that will get you there. Um, we found out that uh, things weren't as perfect in the town itself, and this is why I would like to uh, move on to that, is um, what is happening with trying to get our sidewalks in the best repair that we can. Uh, warnings went out uh, back in March of uh, violations. We have 900 violations within the town. 
Uh, we have a borough ordinance that covers all the, all the violations, and we prescribe to the uh, International Property Code Maintenance uh, Book, and we also prescribe to the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, here's one of our banks that, as you can see, they had quite a lot of violations there. This probably to the cost of about uh, eight to ten thousand dollars to repair. And here's the finished product. Uh, we have a, businesses are kind of really going along with it. Where we're having trouble is with our residents. Here's an example of a residence that had to take out uh, a long section, and uh, that was quite expensive for them and this is where we're getting some of our pushback from the residents is that they can't afford to have that done we're trying to work with everybody and we're hoping uh, in the long run over the course of a year or so uh, all these sidewalks will be repaired uh, this is that sidewalk that was removed and replaced as you can see a uh, beautiful job um, we have this this is kind of the good um, the, with the upcoming slides, I'm going to show you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and talking about curb cuts, our town, I believe, is entirely uh, up to code on that. Uh, we have this with the help of the county of Salem and uh, our forefathers recognizing this back 25 years ago, curb cuts were began. And actually, we've had to take some curb cuts out to put them back in that are more compliant. Uh, with what the ADA, ADA calls for today. Um, we used to have a lot of them that were made with brick pavers and uh, they were at that time okay, but they've gone to these rubber mats with the pebbles on them. And I believe they told me one of the reasons is because of uh, the blind, a blind person would have an easier time uh, finding their way with the bubbles on the top. Um, Here's an example of what we're dealing with, one of the 900 violations. Uh, this falls under uh, an ordinance where it has more than three cracks or so much of the area is destroyed by either weather, being run over by a vehicle, pulling into a driveway. Uh, all these have to be removed and replaced. Uh, some of the errors we do have, which you can see, again, we have spalding here, that would be on the bottom where you can see the stones, there's a good chance that that sidewalk could be 70, 80 years old. And what happens through the, the weather, the salt, it eats away at the concrete and you get the, so, the stones are now seen and they also become a tripping hazard. Uh, this is a driveway entrance. You can see that's all been, the aprons all been uh, busted and you can see a little bit further on the top uh, how the cracks. Fortunately, the whole town is not like this. Uh, we have one street, uh, our Broad Street, which is probably the oldest town or the oldest street in town that has the worst damage. Uh, here's one where you can see they've done some improvements already. Um, this area where you see the slab has raised up. That is probably about 60% of our problem. Uh, the ADA calls for no rise larger than a quarter of an inch. Uh, we have a company that comes around and they can actually grind that down and also make the the pitch or the degree of pitch compliant that it does not become a tripping hazard. That's kind of the phrase that we've been going with. If it's a tripping hazard, it must be removed. This is probably the worst example of what we have found in the borough. As a matter of fact, that piece that is right next to the tree um, was responsible for really getting this project going about uh, 18 months ago. We had a five-year-old girl with her grandmother on a, on a little push scooter, and the grandmother turned around and she heard her granddaughter scream. She's laying on the ground. She drove all of her bottom teeth through her bottom lip. Uh, she's had five plastic surgeries, uh, two surgeries on her gums and teeth. And uh, people say to me, well, what's the problem with that? Uh, I don't think you need to be an engineer to understand that is just not acceptable. And these are the problems that we're trying to, to contact. Uh, the person that lives in the house, uh, single mother, uh, house is in foreclosure. As you can see, the challenges are there, but 
we're up to the challenges. We're being compassionate with the homeowner, but they have to understand it has to be done and we will work with them to try to have that completed. Um, this also includes the business. Uh, this is one section where uh, one building has burned down and one was removed. And uh, the young gentleman bought the two buildings existing. One is the old schoolhouse and one is an old barn. And he's putting a yoga studio and uh, he's deals with antique uh, car parts and memorabilia. So this is quite a project for him. Uh, as you can see, there's been some curb work done and uh, he'll be replacing all that. That's to the tune of about $10,000 also. So as you can see, to become in compliance, it's just not, we look at not as easy to say, well, go around it. No, we're not going around it. We're replacing it, repairing it, whatever can be done. And uh, hopefully within a year, 18 months, uh, everything will be in place where we want it to be. Uh, being a rural community uh, and having sidewalks, and this is one of the things that has really encouraged us. We have a lot of people in both of the townships that come in, they walk, especially after knee surgeries. We see uh, a lot of people being pushed around in wheelchairs. Uh, we had one gentleman that broke his neck that could still use a scooter. Uh, certain areas like this, he would have to go out onto the street. And that's just not, uh, that's just not right for him to have to do that. And uh, we're bringing everything up to code and uh, We'll have a walkability of any town in New Jersey, and uh, we hope that's also a selling point, which we've been to some seminars that said walkability and uh, sidewalks in towns are a real plus for uh, improving real estate sales. So um, it's a wonderful project. Uh, we have most of the people on board, the ones that aren't, we're trying to get them on board, and uh, we hope to have this done in the very near future. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. And thanks to all of our presenters. Um, I don't know that we'll have any time for questions right now. Um, but as I said, we will work to get you responses to those that have been sent in already. Um, and I'm going to just make a few final announcements here. Um, Great. Uh, just another thank you to all of our great sponsors that support America Walks on a regular basis, including those that you see here. If you're interested in um, becoming a sponsor of America Walks or of uh, making a donation to the organization, you can learn all about that program on our website. Um, you support the webinars as well as things like our community change grants, our walking college fellows, and all of the work that we do. I do want to just quickly make mention that we do have a webinar coming up in October, in August. Um, that date, that date is right. Um, August 8th, our monthly webinar will be looking at speed management through rolling call for slower speeds. I encourage you to attend. We'll have some great representatives from people um, who are doing the hard work of uh, making our community safer. Um, thanks again for joining us today for our webinar, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you.